threatened. Um, they were rampaging along, won their first two games. They've lost their last two, but they could have probably won both of them. A fantastic looking facility there in the deep south. I'm sure they're going to come out fine tonight. From memory, he was leading last week. Are you going to be leading this week? Or from the bottom with six points and second from bottom with throw? Yes and no. Yes and no. It paid off for them. They got a two, double the four, and one six points. Depends what the teams above you do, doesn't it? Welcome to Unbiased with Miles Davis. It's where we look behind the scenes at the people and the stories of bowls in New Zealand. Joining me today, a person who probably doesn't need an introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway because I'm a polite person, uh, Blackjack Mike Kernahan. Uh, good morning, Mike. Good morning, Miles. How are we today? I'm exceedingly well, mate. Exceedingly well. Now, I, there's so many things I, I want to ask you, and we've only got a short period of time, so I'm going to get straight into it. I understand you were born in the UK in a rather impoverished part of it. Um, what, tell us about your, your childhood and how old were you when you came over to New Zealand? Yeah, born in a wee town called Wallasey, which is just over the Mersey River from the mighty city of Liverpool. Um, Dad worked for Cadbury's and uh, he'd been trying to get out or out of England from, uh, from the time he left the Navy being demobbed from the war and in 1962, there was an opportunity to come over to New Zealand uh, with Cadbury's, and I was six at the time, and, and so we ventured forth. And every time I go back to England, and it's no disrespect to England, but I go, great decision, Mum and Dad. <laughs> we, we should leave that by the sides before we start arguing, before we've got really into this interview about whether, whether it was a good decision or not. So do you remember anything at all? Um, uh, about living in the UK or is it just a real distant memory and only what your parents tell you? It's a very distant memory and I'm, I don't know how long we've got but I actually visited my uh, my house when I went to the Com Games in 2002 and took a week off um, afterwards and drove around England but went to Wallasey and knocked on the door of the house that I'd lived in and the lady let me in and we had a great time. So not many memories because um, I'm a bit young, really. I can remember the boat trip out. We went through the Suez Canal, and uh, that's when it was still open, obviously, to traffic. And so we, we boated out. It took about six weeks. Loved every minute of it. I can imagine that, actually, a, 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 a boat trip for a young kid. I don't know whether your parents would have enjoyed it quite as much as uh, as you <laughs> did. Now, so you get over here, and uh, Cadbury's, were you, did you go straight to Dunedin? Yeah, we went straight to Dunedin, and... Um, Managed to uh, get to a primary school called Kikra Primary School, which coincidentally my wife currently teaches at. So um, quite a quite a connection with the Kikra Primary School. We we eventually got a state house in Brockville, um, which was a huge uh, state housing area, brand new at the time, and lived there. I lived there till I was 21, till I left home, and mum and dad eventually bought the house and uh, lived happily ever after. That's magnificent. Now, you, you've mentioned your primary school. Where did you go? When you left primary school and went to college, where, where did you go? The mighty Otago Boys High School. Oh, so going up in yes. the world. Oh, yes, very much so. And what sports did you play when, uh, when you were at, at high school? Oh, everything, mate. So cricket, football, uh, did a bit of swimming, got into athletics when, in my third form year and did athletics and dropped the cricket uh, uh, in the third form and, and uh, did athletics right through to the end of high school. So I was an 800 and 1,500 metre runner. Not uh, world class, but enjoyed it. Now, football, I understand, was, was one of your real passions as well that you, uh, that you played a lot of. Um, tell us a bit about that. How did you get into that and how did you go on after leaving school? Yeah, so football probably still is my major passion, to be honest, Miles. And you know, obviously, bowls has taken a, a front seat over the last twenty odd years, but football was what I loved and what I lived for, really. So, played all the age groups and South Island teams as a youngster. You know, the under 12, 14 and sixteen back in the day. Uh, left school, went to Dunedin City, which was relatively new. They weren't in the National League at that stage, but we we got promoted to the National League a couple of years after I left school. So that's where I started my National League career and. 
that was back in the day, Miles, and, and you always look back and think we were better in those days, and I'm not saying we were, but that team that went to the World Cup in 1982, every single player bar Winton Roofer played football in New Zealand, played in the National League. So it was a very good league back in those days, and I'm sure I'm not sure whether you can remember that far back in terms of football in New Zealand. Um, I got over here 84, 85, and it was it was still really strong then. And, and I'm disappointed. We we can probably have a big chat about the state of football uh, later. What was your crowning achievement as a player? Oh, I don't think I had too many. I mean, I played just over 100 games, I think, National League. Um, never won a title. Played in Nelson uh, in, what year was that? Uh, 1979. Um, and that was Doug Moore coached that, and he had a very, very good young side. So Ricky Herbert was there, Richard Wilson, the goalkeeper, Kenny Creswell. Creswell. What about Slottermaker? Was he there? No, he wasn't there then that year. He came the next year, I think. He had been there, and then he went away, and then he came back. Same with Peter Simonson. He um, he didn't play that year, but came the next year. So that was a really good year. for. Um, it was probably the most memorable as far as I'm concerned, just in terms of the players we had and the the fun we had. I was the second oldest and I was 24. Old Charlie Ewer, I don't know whether you remember him, he was the oldest guy in the team. Now, you, we'll talk a little bit later about your, your furtherance in football going into the administrative side, but I, yep. I read somewhere that you didn't really take up bowls seriously till you were 32, which, especially nowadays, is, is, uh, is a late sort of starter. Had you dabbled with it before then? Yeah, I had. Look, I dad, when I was about 21, Dad had just started playing bowls, um, and he told me I was useless at cricket because when I stopped athletics, I started playing cricket again. Said, no good at cricket, come and have a role. And that was when I was 21, and, and um, so I went, had a role, and luckily there were a couple of young fellas. Terry Scott was one of them who were in the clubhouse that day, and I thought, oh, there's some other young fellas, so I'll start playing. So I played for a year, <laughs> and then... Then I uh, then I stopped playing and and uh, just got really involved in my football and played again maybe when I was about 28 29 and uh, but I only really dabbled on it because football was still the priority and so I play sort of up to Christmas and then pre-season training started for the national league and I'd stop at Christmas time so I stopped football at 32. One of those situations, Miles, and you could probably relate to this, where you're still hurting on Tuesday after the game on Sunday. So I thought that was about the right time to give up. And uh, so I was 32 when I finished football, and that's when I started playing uh, playing bowls seriously. What was it about bowls that, that attracted to you as a game rather than going off and playing golf or, or carrying on with cricket? Well, I do play golf as well. So. <laughs> but, but I think... Look, I'm I'm probably the most competitive person on the planet. So it was just a sport where you could be really competitive and enjoy that side of it as well as the, obviously the camaraderie and the mateship that you get with all sports. But it was really something that I could get my teeth into and be really competitive in. Right. Now, w- when did you first start and making an impact? I understand it was reasonably quickly that you started to, to progress. Like, for instance, when did you win your first national title? Run us through that. So, first national title was quite a long way away, actually, but I got lucky. I played in the old Super Bowls in those days and got to the national final and lost the semi final. And um, Lawson was in there, Dickerson with Clive Major. Lawson, Dickerson and myself were the semi-finalists and Clive Major won it. So <laughs> that was a bit of a surprise. But at that tournament, um, I, a guy uh, invited me to what in those days was probably the most prestigious singles tournament in New Zealand in, in Blenheim. And the first prize was $5,000 and I I managed to win it, beat Brassy in the semi-final and Lawson in the final and... and um, Won my five grand, and and that sort of got me in front of, or got the attention of, oh, I guess the the national selectors at the time. And there was a a year later, there was a a, a national trial, 1990, 91, and um, played on that. Played with Morris Symes in the triples and fours, and we won five out of five. And so 
they picked a team in 1991 to go to the UK and it was really, they wanted to pick the team that they they had in mind for World Bowls in 92. And um, Rowan Brassy and Peter Ballas made themselves unavailable, so they were looking for a lead and I was fortunate enough to to be selected in that team. And so I was 36, played seriously for about four or five years and and um, found myself in the New Zealand team. Probably a little early, to be fair, but uh, you make the most of the opportunities, and that's when it started, really. Well, I mean, when you get the likes of Brassy and Bellis pulling out, that is a massive opportunity for you For you to... to and you obviously took your, your chance there. Now, I, after... Being in that national side, and we know that, that I'll talk a little bit later about the sort of being dropped in and out of it, but then yep. you decided to, you joined Bowls New Zealand um, and you decided to sort of pull out of, of, of playing competitively. What, what's the story there? So in 94, we went went to the Commonwealth Games and I played the pairs with uh, Philip Scoglin and we got within one game of getting to the final and played the Aussies and lost. And uh, so we didn't get a medal Missed out on playing in the final. And uh, then in 96, as you say, I got the opportunity to um, to get 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 a role in, in, at Bowls New Zealand. And, and so we moved to Auckland for three years, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. What it meant, though, was that I couldn't – because I was development manager and high performance manager. It was sort of a combined role. And uh, so – you simply can't play at the elite level or make yourself available whilst you're actually trying to run the cutter. So, um, so that took my my bowls took a back seat then, and uh, really only got back into it in '99 when I finished with Bowls New Zealand and came back to Dunedin. What have you done generally during your your professional career? I, I see a lot of CEO stuff. How how did you manage to maraud your way up to become CEO? <laughs> I, I see you're deputy CEO at New Zealand Football. Um, yeah. There's badminton, um, the Cancer Society. Uh, for instance, football deputy New Zealand Football deputy CEO. How did that happen? When did that happen? So I in nineteen where was it? I know, 2002, I think it was, when I, I, I went to uh, Manchester for the Commonwealth Games, got a bronze medal on the singles there. And the following year, an opportunity came up at Triathlon New Zealand. They'd never had a CEO of the organisation. It was very much a young organisation, and they advertised for the role, and I applied, and I was lucky enough to get it. And when, it, when you say CEO, there were actually only three employees um, myself, uh, admin person, and Mark Elliott, who was the high performance manager and, and a very good coach. And look, I've been lucky. I've been really privileged, Miles, in terms of what I've been able to do and the opportunities I've I've had. And in 2004 in Athens, you'll recall that uh, that's when Hamish Carter and Bevan Doherty got one two and uh, at the Olympics. And I was there that day and was fortunate enough to be in, in, in at the finish line when they came in one two. So that was a huge fillip for triathlon New Zealand and and um, and that's where I guess the story really started in terms of you know the success that triathlon have enjoyed over the last twenty years. Um, and then in two thousand and five ish, um, the role of Deputy C of New Zealand Football was advertised and as, as we discussed it's my absolute passion and I applied and was lucky enough to get it and, and that was the time when Graham Cedar was CE of New Zealand Football so I had responsibility for the domestic game um, so every, all of the activity within within uh, you know the game domestically in New Zealand and I just loved that role I was there for about three and a half years had a fantastic time so now we know who to blame why the state of the game is in such disarray. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, now you'll remember a guy called John Herdman. Yes. So John worked for me. He We brought him in. Um, he'd worked in Invercargill and done a brilliant job down there, and I was aware of him. And uh, he had a role with New Zealand football and was not very happy. And so we got him inside the tent in terms of um, – you know, working working closely with me, and and he just did a brilliant, brilliant job. That guy was amazing, and 
that's when he started coaching, first of all, the New Zealand under-17 women's team, and then he went on to the under-20s, then he went on to the senior team. And I have the highest regard for him as a, as a coach. Um, just a wonderful guy. Yeah, I, I I remember John well, and and um, he's he's well respected uh, in in the game around the world, especially in the in the women's game. I, it's interesting though. So you've got quite very. There's a lot of sport in your life, in your professional life, as well as in your in your personal life. But if we get back to um, to bowls. The second time um, that to, uh, that you get dropped, you got dropped from for the 2004 um, World Championships, um, and you decided you'd had enough. What exactly went through your mind, and and why did you make the decision to quit? So, I don't want to sound bitter, Miles. <laughs> no, no, hey, be, this is what we want. We want the truth. Get it out. You've got to vent your spleen. It's good for you. Exactly. So. As I say, I won the New Zealand singles in 2001 and 2002 and then went to the Commonwealth Games, got a bronze medal uh, in the singles in 2002. Then we went on a tour of Britain in 2003 and um, there were six guys there and, and uh, that went away and, and Gary was one of them, Brass was one of them. Well, really, really good side. And uh, I had the second best record of the six of us over the course of that month-long tour of Britain. And then they picked the World Bowls team shortly after that for 2004 and and I didn't get picked. And so I got a bit grumpy, I have to say, because I'd had this record over the last three years that was, I thought, pretty pretty darn good. And, and um, you know, it just I just thought, well, I'm never going to get to a World Bowl. So I basically jacked it in. And, and part of the reason was I was commuting for that New Zealand football role, so I'd I'd um, spend a few weeks up in Auckland and then go home for a weekend. And the kids, our children who'd been um, born in uh, 1990 and 92 were they just entering their teenage years. And it was a bit unfair of me to come home and, and uh, not spend time with them and be interested in what that was going on in their lives um, rather than me just sodding off to, to bowl. So I didn't play for about uh, five years apart from one year and... 2007 when the Nationals were in Dunedin and I hadn't played a bowl for three years and my best mate Dave Archer said, do you want to play in the in the pairs with me? And I said, oh, yeah, why not? So used the singles as my, my practice and didn't qualify. Went into the pairs, played the first day leading for Dave and we won two out of three and I skipped from there on in and we actually went through and won it. <laughs> I was going to but, ask you about that because you know, to, to win – that after not playing for, for three years, really, uh, hardly touching a bowl, um, and to go out there and win with your best mate, who I, I understand you've known him since he was about, you were about 10. Yeah. Uh, so that's a, that's a long lasting relationship. How does that stack up against any other title that you've won? Well, it's probably my favourite, to be honest, um, mainly because you're playing with your best mate. Uh, and, you know, he hadn't won a national title before. And so it was really cool, and it was in Dunedin, so our kids were there, and Dave and Barbara's daughter Sarah was there, so you know, watching on green, and so it was just a really, really cool week, really, and and uh, so that's my favourite. Um, probably a bit lucky to start playing as well as we did at the right time, but um, yeah, there we are. So that was a bit of a highlight, and then I didn't play again for another couple of years. <laughs> no, it's, so. it's interesting. I, I, it's interesting. I'll just make one quick comment though that you're saying, you know, that wasn't fair on the kids as well, and you use that as an excuse. But you'd have been quite happy to bugger off to the World Championships and leave them alone had you been selected. So maybe Absolutely. that's a little bit disingenuous of you there, Mike, well, Mike <laughs> of using your children <laughs> as an excuse for your for your tantrum. That well. So I made the decision not, you know, when I when the decision was made for me um, that I wasn't in the World Bowls time, I did sit back and reflect on what I was going to do. So it wasn't a case of, oh, it's all about the kids. But when I thought long and hard about it and talking with Jan, my wife, who's, you know, been, you know, she's a genius really to have put up with me for so long, um, it was just easy, easy call to make and it, and it, you know, Kate was really involved. Our daughter was really involved in the sport. And Liam, our son, he's he's a really, really good bagpiper now. And he was just 
they were just getting into their their things. So it was actually a reasonably easy decision not to not to pursue bowls because I'd been dropped again, um, and uh, take some time out. Now you were one of the first people in bowls to um, to take a sort of mental strength. And those sort of powers, and, and Professor Ken Hodge, I understand, was a was a major driver for you, or major influence on you. How did you come across him, and how did you start thinking about that aspect of the game? So we could spend an hour talking about this because it's been a huge part of what I've been able to achieve. And and back in 1989 um, was when I got got in touch with Ken, and and he was a lecturer then. Um, and the reason was, in, in the 80s, Dunedin had six players who'd all played for New Zealand during the 80s. So it was a really, really strong environment from a bowls perspective. And, and I was getting close, but not not getting over the line with when I played against them. And Bruce Blair, and you probably know Bruce, um, played cricket for New Zealand. He was right into it, and he gave me a book. Uh, and I read it and I thought, there's something in this. So in 89, I got hold of Ken Hodge and he knew nothing about bowls, but that didn't matter. And and he's a farm boy from Southland who, who'd who done a really, you know, played um, prop for University A and not sure if he played for Otago or not. And and we got on like a house on fire and, and, um, and we just started from there. So he just taught me the basics, which I'm, I was pretty dumb in those days in terms of understanding how the mind worked and and uh, just really simple things made a huge difference for me. Now, oh, that's it's interesting that. And, and are you still a big advocate of that today? Do you encourage other people within your sphere, um, within the, the professional environments that you've been in to, to sort of undertake a bit of coaching in that regard? Yeah, look, we're fortunate. Bowls New Zealand's really fortunate and has been for the last 10 years to have a guy called uh, John Quinn as our mental skills guy. And John works with Tom Walsh, um, works with the Crusaders, has done quite a lot of work with um, with netball and Canterbury and uh, is also doing a lot of work with the age group New Zealand rugby teams. And he's outstanding. And we have, him and I have a fantastic relationship. And he's just trying very hard to to work with the, the players individually in bowls and also as a group to understand the benefits of, of um, using a set of mental skills that will just give you that 1% that you need to, to go from being a really good domestic player to being able to compete at the international level. Um, thinking of, of the mental strength aspect uh, of it and being able to focus on your game and, and get rid of distractions, because it, it, it is uh, 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 quite a, a mental game you watch bowls because it's such a matter of, of fine degrees. The 2002 Commonwealth Games, uh, your quarter-final against Steve Glassham. <laughs> got to, everyone's going to want to know the inside story uh, on that. So um, you're having a tight tussle with Steve Glasson and the umpire or the technical official or whatever we want to call him, Michael Roberts disqualifies a Steve Glasson bowl. What what exactly happened? <laughs> well, it actually started on the third end and I have to say, I have to put my hand up and say that I and Steve Glasson did not, um, we, were, we were both out of line in a lot of ways, the way we, we performed on that day. So on the third end, Steve, because Steve was a, had a very good forehand run shot and not so good backhand run shot. And the way the head was sitting, it was really a backhand runner and he didn't want to play it. So he stood off the mat, basically, and with his third bowl and ran up the head and missed. And, and I said to the umpire, because each rink had an umpire, and I turned around to the umpire and said, look, I think he's foot folded here. Can you have a look at it the next time? So... He did that, and Steve played it with his last and got it, and uh, so got two when I was holding one, and I turned around the umpire and I said, so did he foot fault? And he went, yep. And I said, so what do we do now? And the umpire says, well, look, I don't know. I'll go and check. So he ran away and came back at the start of the next end and said, look, I've got to give him a warning. And I said, that's fine. So they gave him a warning, and that same end, the fourth end, I followed my bowl up, and as we all know in bowls, you've actually got to reach – 
you've got to be two metres past the head when your bowls come your bowl comes to rest. And and um, I didn't make it. And the Aussies then complained to the umpire, and I got a warning for not reaching the head. And so it went on like this for the whole <laughs> game, and it was a bit banal, really. But hey, that's the way it was. And we were both desperate to win because you guaranteed a medal if you win. And then. Just out of the blue, on that particular end, Steve drew a toucher, didn't reach the head, and the umpire walked on and picked the ball up. Well, it was about 17-15 to him at that stage, and he didn't score again. And uh, Steve still refuses to shake my hand. Is that right, after all these years? I mean, that's 19 years ago now. Um, yeah. And I, under, I understand that the, um, the coach... Jeff Oakley for the Australian coach basically threatened violence on any New Zealanders who went into the uh, the media sessions while they were around. Is that right? It was pretty messy. I can remember us sitting. There was quite a spectator area, and we all sat. All the Kiwis sat together after that game, and the Aussies were a few tables away, and and um, it was pretty ugly to be fair. But look, to be fair, most of the players there that I've seen since, uh, you know, they've got over it and we've certainly got over it. Um, but, uh, you know, when, when we won the World Fours in 2016 and beat the Aussies and Steve Glasson was the coach, he didn't shake my hand. He um, he uh, shook everyone else's hand but mine. So, yeah, that's life. I, I mean, I've got over it. I couldn't care less now, to be honest, and, and uh, you just move on. Yeah, it's quite interesting. I was just wondering whether maybe he needs a bit of that sort of mental strength <laughs> coaching and, and conditioning to be able to, to, to overcome something like that after after 19 years. Uh, that's the last medal, your bronze medal there is the last medal won by uh, a male blackjack at the Commonwealth Games. What, what do you put that down to? Is it is it the level of competition? Is it, is it a bogey tournament? I honestly couldn't answer that, Moz. I've got no idea. And, and it's really disappointing because the women have won medals pretty much every Commonwealth Games, and obviously Joe Evers and Val Smith have done their bit, but there have been others. Um, look, I honestly don't know why we haven't done so well at a Commonwealth Games. I mean, we've had the players, certainly, um, and you would have thought over in Melbourne on greens that, you know, pretty decent, we might have done a little better than we had, but we haven't, and I can't answer that. Oh, oh, fair enough. Well, hopefully in the future now, after you sort of got over... Um, the, the bitter disappointment of, of not making that 2004 uh, world champion. You came back into the game um, yep. about 11 years, I think it was, 11 or 12 years. And then you're just sort of back into it. You make it into, you finally make it to your, to your world championship and you win two medals, a bronze yeah. and a gold. Yeah, look, that was pretty special to be fair. I'm still a bit disappointed with the way I started in the semi final of the the pairs and sort of let Shannon down a little bit. Um, we were 7-0 down, I think, after five ends, and I was l seriously useless in those first five ends. Came right of it, and um, we made a bit of a game of it, but we never really got back in the game. And and I've always looked back on that and thought that's probably the worst game I've played, you know, in, in a game where it really counted for New Zealand. But the next week was the fours, and, and look, I have to say we... That was a pretty dominant performance um, from all four of us, really, and uh, right through the week. We won all of our games, and I think we averaged winning by something like about 17 shots and per game. And, you know, to win a game of fours internationally, if you win by three or four, that's a good victory. So we we really clicked that, that second week and got to the final against the Aussies, and they had a bloody good side and it, and it should have been a very close game but you know Ali Forsyth was brilliant and the boys you know we, we played well and uh, so it was a big thrill. Yeah, it's good when everything clicks together like that and, and talking of things clicking together on your personal front you, you mentioned Jan you mentioned your kids how did, how did you two meet? <laughs> Got set up to be fair um, so god so, um, come on, tell the Jan truth. Hate... Gonna, I'll be ringing Jan after this and finding out. Sure, she'll, she'll. This is a true story, but I won't tell you all of the stories. But 
I was playing in a volleyball, social volleyball team, and I was the token male in the mixed volleyball team because all the girls that played didn't want to play in the girls' thing. They wanted to play in the in the mix. And um, a very, very good friend of our, of, of mine at the time who worked with Jan at, at – uh, at North East Valley Primary School, she um, she brought Jan along one day and my interest was piqued and uh, the rest is history. So uh, re- I think Jan very reluctantly agreed to go out on a, go to dinner for our first date and it sort of went from there. Uh, well, hey, it's obviously, how long, how long have you been together now? Oh, 30, 32 years. You better get it right. What yeah. day's your anniversary? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's another funny story. March the 10th, actually, so just had it. So why is it funny? Come on. Because neither of us could remember whether it was the 10th or, or the 11th <laughs> for a long time, and both of us couldn't. But my mum, bless her, who's 88 now, soon to become 89, she always sent a card in the mail. Um, and so we, around that time, we'd always rush to the letterbox and try and be the one that got the card because mum knew neither of us neither <laughs> of us were sure. So we always got the one upmanship if you got the card or oh, happy anniversary, darling. Um or she would be do it she'd get there first and do it to me. So we now know it's the tenth of March. Fantastic. That's a lovely story. <laughs> just just a couple of uh, uh, final little things here. Just a little personal, just quick fire uh, uh, questions. A, a sports star that that um, that you admire, that you really admire, Roger Federer. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, it'd be hard not to admire uh, him. Um, you went to dinner uh, for your first date, but what would you choose to eat if it was your last meal? Not that I'm threatening so, you or anything. Mike, so right? we, we've got a, there's a restaurant in Dunedin, I don't know whether you've ever been to it, called Bacchus, and they do the best steaks in town. So Jan and I go there on and off uh, maybe four or five times a year and we just indulge ourselves in their fillet steak. It's absolutely outstanding. Uh, fam- Favourite artiste, you know, musically-wise, uh, that you think, oh, I'd definitely go and see that concert if it came to, to uh, Dunedin? Well, half of them are dead now, but the Beatles. Oh, of course, it's that Liverpool connection here. <laughs> uh, again. I, I'm, I'm deliberately not going to ask you your favourite football team, by the way, because I, I already know it, and we don't want blaspheming on on, on there. Uh, in terms of your bowls, going forward, uh, how you know, where do you see yourself going? The, the world champs obviously got. You know, COVID um, battered them to, to pieces. Do you want to still hang around for a bit longer? Have you still got ambitions on the international scene? So that's a that's an interesting question. I, I've I've been coaching myself for a wee while now, and and coached a few athletes, and I'm really keen on getting into that environment. And it's just a matter of when the right time to give up playing and do that is. Um, because I'm 65, coming up 66, there's only so many um, games you've got left in you, I think, at that international level. So it's a, it's almost a year-by-year year thing at the moment, Miles, as to how long I'll keep playing. Well, I'm just, uh, I'm sure there's lots of people out there that uh, that hope you've got a few more international games in you, maybe another world champ, and maybe another gold medal. Maybe you can make it up to Shannon and, and win a pairs with him, seeing as you feel exactly. that, that, that you've let him down. Thank you so much for your, your time, Mike Kernahan, and, and best wishes in regards to your family, all your family. Thank you so much, Miles. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Take care. And they were rampaging along, won their first two games. They've lost their last two, but they could have probably won both of them. Fantastic looking facility there in the deep south. I'm sure they're going to come out firing tonight. From memory, he was leading last week. Are you going to be leading this week or? The bottom of six points and second for bottom of throw. Yes and no. Yes and no. Paid off for them. They got a two, double the four, and one six points. Depends what the teams above you do, doesn't it? I'm Bunch. I was dead.